hello everyone welcome back to my channel so in this video i'm gonna be doing uh questions about myocardial infarction complications with you guys and all the murmurs and stuff as well as the timeline so let's do some questions together i have not seen those questions yet before guys so it's gonna be the first time for me just like you so let's do it together Alright, so the first question, I'm going to read the last two lines as usual and then read the um, answer choices. Here, the last two lines say, despite appropriate measures, he dies, unfortunately. Microscopic evaluation of the myocardium is most likely to show which of the following. And the answer choices show coagulative necrosis with dense neutrophilic infiltrate, which is essentially the case with any infarction, by the way. B is wavy myocardial fibers without inflammatory cells. And I think that would be after resolution, like weeks later. Um, C is low cellularity with dense non-contractile scar tissue. And so that would be in the case of um, ventricular aneurysm or like a late complication. Dense granulation tissue with collagenous scar formation. That would be like one or two weeks in when there's still granulation tissue. Or hyperemic granulation tissue with abundant macrophages. All right, so let's see how many days out are we of the uh, MI so that we can decide which one to choose who have an 80 year old man is admitted to the hospital after the sudden onset of substernal chest pain and shortness of breath sitting in a chair obviously this is typical chest pain has hypertension type 2 diabetes and is a smoker for 42 years four days after admission this is the timeline here guys you need to be aware of while answering mi questions Four days after admission, he becomes tachycardic, then loses consciousness, and the cardiac monitor shows irregular electric activity. So he actually develops V-fib or any uh, sort of life-threatening arrhythmia. Now, cardiac exam, it's very important here to note the murmurs, guys, shows a new systolic murmur at the apex. When I say the apex, it means it's a mitral valve murmur, right? Now, is it systolic or diastolic? The apex or the, the mitral valve usually opens during diastole. So if a systolic murmur happens, then it must be regurgitant. Why is it open during systole? It should open diastole. So it's not closed as it should be. So this is a murmur of mitral regurgitation that has happened, guys, in this patient, probably due to papillary muscle rupture. If you take a look here at the uh, complications, it would show you that within three days, after three days, papillary muscle rupture may lead to acute mitral regurgitation. Here, this is the papillary muscle that has lost its blood supply and then uh, the blood regurged during systole and this leads to acute heart failure. Plus the fact this patient also had an arrhythmia, which can happen at any day, including the first day of MI, first hour even. And that's probably the cause of death. So he's asking you guys, four days after an MI, what would be expected on autopsy, right? That's essentially the question. So is a coagulative necrosis with dense neutrophilic infiltrate? We know, guys, that neutrophils disappear after three days. So it's not expected to have neutrophils still there four days later, right? Now, do you have wavy myocardial fibers without inflammatory cells? Do inflammatory cells just disappear uh, four days later? Of course, there remains macrophages and stuff like that. Uh, so obviously that's not B as well. This would be the case like months later, right? But the inflammatory reaction is still there for days later. It's just not neutrophils, right? Um, C shows low cellularity with dense non-contractile scar tissue. Collagen still hasn't got the time to form, guys. So it's not C. Dense granulation tissue or hyperemic granulation tissue. I would say that four days later, we still have macrophages. So it's hyperemic granulation tissue. Yes, that's the correct answer. And so this is essentially general pathology. Uh, you just need to know. 
what happens during the phases of inflammation, three days or within a week and stuff like that. Three to 10 days post-infarction, we still have macrophages, guys. And this patient had a papillary muscle rupture resulting in acute mitral regurgitation, right? Next up, uh, we're going to read the last two lines again. EKG shows Q waves in the antraceptal lead, so he probably had an MI of the LAD. Pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is 23. This, is, guys, is a reflection of left atrial pressure which is actually too high left atrial pressure should not be above five or maximum 10 this one is 23 which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's current condition so we have a patient with increased left atrial pressure most likely due to left ventricular failure right so I didn't read the vignette yet, but let's check the answer choices. Is it post myocardial infarction syndrome or is it aortic root dilation, which may cause aortic regurgitation? Is it rupture of the chordae tendony, which can lead to acute mitral regurgitation or tricuspid? Rupture of the ventricular free wall can lead to tamponade and rupture of the interventricular septum can lead to VSD. So what is this patient having? We're going to figure out from the murmur. We haven't yet checked the murmur this patient has. We have it 72 hours after admission, which is three days after admission. For an acute MI, a 48-year-old man develops dyspnea and a productive cough with frothy sputum. This, guys, is indicative of acute pulmonary edema. So some sort of blood is essentially acutely regurgitating back into the left atrium, increasing its pressure so much, and ultimately into the lungs, right? This patient is having acute pulmonary edema. What could possibly be the cause? Physical exam shows coarse crackles in both lungs and blowing Blowing holosystolic murmur heard best at the apex. That's it, guys. If a murmur is heard best at the apex, it's a mitral valve murmur. In the setting of post-MI, at this point, three days post-MI, this is the murmur of mitral regurgitation. Again, guys, let's show you the picture here. Three days post-infarction, up to 14 days. Papillary muscle rupture may lead to acute mitral regurgitation. And then all this blood is going to regurgitate back into the left atrium and ultimately through the pulmonary veins into the pulmonary capillaries of the lungs. And this is going to transudate and cause severe pulmonary edema, which will cause this patient dyspnea and coarse crackles hurt. And so it's probably due to rupture of the chordae tendony, right? Now, why isn't it rupture of the interventricular septum, for example? Because this is going to lead to a VSD, and a VSD shifts blood from left to right. So the overload will be more on the right side. Here, the overload is more on the left side. In addition, the murmur of VSD is parasternal, maximum of this area, rather than at the apex, right? All right, guys, next question. We're going to read the last two lines. Pitting edema extends up to the knees bilaterally, and EKG shows Q is in the anterior leads. This patient obviously had an MI. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's hypotension? So currently, the only info I know is that this patient has hypotension and pitting edema, right? So is it ascending aortic dissection rupture? Post-infarction fibrinous pericarditis. Is it left ventricular free wall rupture, which causes tamponade? Probably. Left ventricular aneurysm rupture? Probably. Papillary muscle rupture leads to mitral regurgitation. So would it really cause that? Let's see. Or interventricular septum rupture, which causes a VSD. So four days after being admitted to the ICU for acute substernal chest pain and dyspnea, an 80-year-old man is evaluated for hypotension. So hypotension four days after MI. Coronary angiography on admission showed an occlusion to left anterior descending and a drug eluding stent was placed successfully. He has all the risk factors and medications include aspirin, copidogrel, okay, metoprolol, lisinopril, atorvastatin. He has a normal temperature but with tachycardia, obviously. Blood pressure is 7250, hypotensive, even though the involved 
artery was the left anterior descending. It wasn't an inferior wall infarction, by the way. Cardiac exam shows a normal S1, S2, but a new murmur developed. That's the key, guys. The clue here, in any case, is a new harsh holosystolic murmur heard best at the left sternal border. When you have a murmur that is maximum over the left sternal border, that is a VSD. And what causes a VSD in the setting of MI? It must be septal wall rupture, right? That's the answer. But I'm going to continue explaining to you guys that here there is jugular venous distension and a right parasternal heave with pitting edema. This is indicative of systemic venous congestion. So the problem must be in the right side of the heart. That's what I was telling you initially, guys. The lungs here are clear. The fact that the lungs are clear means there is nothing wrong with the left side of the heart. It's the right side that is overloaded at the moment because in a VSD, blood flows from left to right. As you can see here, 3 to 14 days post-infarction, which is a period we're still in right now. Ventricular septal rupture allows blood from the high pressure left ventricle to go to the right side and congest the entire right side of the heart. Then you're going to feel a parasternal heave and then systemic venous congestion ensues. In the superior vena cava causes jugular venous distension and in the systemic circulation causes lower limb edema, right? And that's what's essentially happening here. Nothing is going on in the lungs and therefore it's clear. And so I would say there's an interventricular septum rupture. And this is a time period where it can happen. It occurs three to five days after MI. This patient is four days in. All right. Okay, guys, I hope you liked this video about MI complications. Let me know what you think. All the best.